Hello, everyone. We'll get started in just a minute once we give everyone a chance to join the event. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn session. On behalf of Water and Waste Digest and today's event sponsor, E1 Sewer Systems, we're glad to have you with us. In today's challenging economic environment, more municipalities and engineering firms are relying on the pressure sewer solution. Pressure sewer systems are gaining widespread acceptance in providing a viable, sustainable, and cost-effective solution for communities considering new wastewater collection systems, replacing failed gravity systems, or for septic to sewer conversions. They provide critical infrastructure with lower construction costs, fewer community disruptions, and minimal environmental impacts compared to the construction of new gravity sewer or the renewal of failed gravity systems. Today's Lunch and Learn will provide valuable information for anyone searching for alternative and improvements to traditional gravity sewer systems or for septic and cesspool to sewer replacement projects. We'll also provide an overview of grinder pump systems that will educate engineers, developers, operators, and consultants. Joining us today is Greg Wall, Sales Manager for US Midwest, Florida and LATAM for Environmental One Corporation. With more than 30 years experience focused on project management, manufacturing support, sales and contract management, Greg has guided many municipalities through successful pressure sewer projects, including several undergoing septic to sewer conversions. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Greg to begin the presentation. Well, Janelle, thank you very much for that great introduction. You know, I think our mission of providing safe and effective sewer for the world really complements what you're doing. Uh, Janelle, I've worked with many companies and clients over the past 20 to 30 years whose interest was focused on getting better, doing things better, looking for a different way to improve. And whether it was the you know, largest corn producer in the world, uh, helping them to improve efficiencies on over 5,000 industrial pumps or working with many rural communities to implement safe and effective sewer. They all had the same guiding principle, and that was to stop doing things the way they've always done and find a better way. I think as we move forward into 2021, uh, 2020 has certainly taught us that it's gonna be a challenging year and perhaps doing things the way that they have always been done is not the best answer. So many of you, if not all of you, have seen this type of chart before. I mean, what do you see here? Do you see half full? Do you see half empty? I see a grossly oversized system. The glass is too big for the water, and that leads to cost overruns. Perhaps you could say it's equivalent to an oversized gravity system. What if we had a sewage collection system that could save money had minimal environmental disruption, solved difficult sewer applications, was proven and reliable. Well, we do, and it's called pressure sewer. Let's have that poll question, you know. So on your screen, there's a poll, go ahead and vote. So this is really great, the results that are coming up. It's looking like about 60, 40 have heard of uh, pressure sewers before. And that's an excellent mix. So looking at the agenda today, history and development, we're gonna talk a little bit about how pressure sewers came about. We're gonna talk a little bit what a pressure sewer system is, why you might choose one, some bottom line cost considerations, and the famous operations and maintenance. So a little bit of history. 
Um, Dr. Gordon Fair in 1965 came up with a um, solution that he proposed to have a combined sewer system, in which case the sewer pipe would be hung, um, suspended from the crown of the combined sewer. It's a very interesting concept, and it led to further discussion. In 1967, under the direction of uh, the Federal Water Pollution Control Administration, Dr. Fair's concept was established as a criteria for an appliance. Now, this is a key word. They had a mentality that the system should be an appliance. And this involved a station and a pump, which evolved into what we know as pressure sewer today. The appliance mentality is critical to what we do in the pressure sewer industry. So it's not labor intensive. You put it in correctly, uh, watch what you're putting down the drain, and it'll last similar to many appliances, if not longer. So General Electric, who had the best and brightest minds of the time, uh, were tasked to develop this appliance. And the GE team, you know, using all their research, all their resources that they had available, concluded, given all the technology that was out there at the time, that a progressive cavity semi-positive displacement grinder pump was best suited for the application. And as we get going in the presentation, I'll show you why they came up with that, um, that solution. These guys believed so strongly in the concept that they broke off and formed Environment One Corporation. Okay, so what is pressure sewer system? Why, you know, I think it's the greatest thing. Wastewater collection systems, we use residential pumps to macerate waste from the home, put it under pressure and send it to a treatment option, whether it's a lift station, a gravity station, or directly to treatment, where it can be efficiently and effectively treated. It's fully sealed, so it keeps waste out of the environment and it keeps the environment out of the waste stream. It uses small diameter pipe and individual grinder pumps. Okay, pressure sewers are proving technology. It gained popularity uh, over the years uh, due to its ability to provide sewer to many areas uh, where you could not install gravity. You know, we like to say flat, wet, rocky, hilly, but there's also, you know, other situations with densely populated areas. Um, if you think of uh, the coal towns up and down the East Coast, maybe Pennsylvania, Kentucky, where many of those homes are built on the side of a mountain, um, you're gonna have a hard time getting gravity in there. Or communities that are um, very remote, it's not gonna make a lot of sense to put in gravity to those areas because it's not going to be cost effective. So pressure sewer really gained a lot of popularity over the you know, 50 plus years uh, that we've been doing it. And in gaining popularity, of course, comes wider acceptance. Um, why was it accepted? Why is it accepted as an acceptable technology today? Why not just do gravity everywhere? Well, pressure sewer has lower environmental impact. Okay, we're not using big equipment that stays in the area for a long time. It's a lower cost and it's a lower social cost. So when you're driving up and down your road every, every day, if you're in an area that's having sewer put in, you're not seeing those big trucks and that big equipment day after day, which will take its toll. With pressure sewer, we'll explain a little bit, it's much more minimally invasive on the environment. It can be put in faster and more predictably. So construction companies can give accurate bids and maintain a tight schedule. It's often very much lower in capital costs than gravity systems. It gives you a lot of flexibility. So just like, you know, the human body uh, has a pump, that's the heart of our system, pressure sewers, the pump in the basin is the heart of the pressure sewer system. So you're going to have the pump basin, the pumps, which 
in today's world, they're either, either going to be progressive cavity or semi-positive displacement or a centrifugal technology. Both are used quite frequently. You're going to have a liquid level sensor that will turn the pump on or off or give alarms. You'll have a control mechanism to operate the motor, and you'll have some type of system to remove the pump from the basin. So if we do a profile view of the pressure sewer system, you're going to have the basin, you know, typically in the yard of a home, the waste is going to flow into the basin. As it flows into the basin, it's going to create a level. And when that level hits a predetermined um, level, when the water, the waste hits a predetermined level, the pump's going to turn on and do its job. It's going to macerate that waste and pump it away under pressure. When it reaches the next predetermined level, it will turn off. In the case that it doesn't turn on or you get a lot of flow, uh, you can set alarms so that you get an audible alarm and a visual alarm. Now, key to pressure sewers, okay? You might be thinking, wow, I'm gonna have all these pumps out there, a lot of connections. These things are gonna be running all the time. The pressure sewer pump runs for a short period of time. 30 seconds to a minute, and then it pumps it down and it turns off. And it'll do this many times during the day. But it's not uh, applicable to think about many, many pumps running all day long. Okay, they come on, they go off, and it's very uh, efficient and effective. And since they run in that manner, they're going to last a long time. So once the pump turns on and macerates it, as I mentioned, it's going to pump it through small diameter pipe under pressure toward a force main uh, through a lateral assembly and on its way to treatment. Now, usually, typically at the, at the road, um, you're going to have a curb box, which includes a check valve, um, a, uh, a shutoff valve, and probably a, a clean out mechanism. Uh, but this is the basics of a pressure sewer system. The waste comes down from the home by gravity, falls into the tank, fills up to a certain level, pump macerates it, sends it on its way to treatment. So I mentioned that there's a couple prevailing technologies out there. Centrifugal, which most everybody's familiar with, but also progressive cavity, which we use at E1. When we talk about centrifugal pumps, you're gonna have an impeller that's gonna operate at a high speed, which will impart a velocity to the liquid. And as that liquid gains velocity, it is directed towards a discharge volute, which will convert the velocity energy into pressure energy. So you're gonna, that's how the pressure um, comes about on a centrifugal pump. Because of the nature of the centrifugal pump, it's going to be affected by system pressure. And you may have to have different sizes of impellers depending upon how far or how much you need to pump and at what uh, head you need to achieve or flow for that matter. With a progressive cavity pump, in this case, it's semi-positive displacement because there is some slip with the uh, elastomeric stator. The stainless steel rotor will operate within this stator through a series of sealed chambers. And each time it passes the chambers, it's going to impart pressure to the liquid. It's going to produce a constant flow rate. And it's only marginally affected, as I'll show you in a minute, by outside pressures, such as system head friction losses. At the heart, of the semi-positive displacement pump, the progressive cavity that we use is the performance curve. Now this curve, as you can see, is nearly vertical. So what that means, if I can get my, uh, my laser to work, okay? With a change in pressure or head, you got pressure on the uh, y-axis and feed, feed over here as well. With a change in head, you get a minimal 
uh, change in flow. And what does that mean? For those of uh, people designing a system or using a system, it's very predictable and it's, it's predictable and stable. And if you're an engineer in the house, that those are two of your favorite words, right? Predictable and stable. So with this curve being nearly vertical, regardless of the amount of head that it needs to pump, you're going to get a small variation in flow. Conversely, if you lay that curve over the typical centrifugal pump curve, which is shown here, okay, it's a typical curve. If you look at the head that needs to be produced going up the y-axis, you're going to get with a centrifugal pump a large variation in flow. And in some cases, damaging flow, cavitation. So as the head requirements change, you're gonna get different flow rates. And with the centrifugal pumps, the pumps are gonna hunt up and down as the demand you know, changes. As you put more flow into the pipes, you're going to get more friction that you need to overcome. And that's what these numbers here are showing, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, is the, is the number of pumps that kick on the head that's required to push the waste through the system. And again, with the vertical uh, semi-positive displacement curve, progressive cavity, it's, it's very uh, predictable. With the centrifugal curve, you're gonna get a lot more variation. So I hope that explained uh, the difference between the two technologies. And we have another poll question. Janelle, there we go. What is your biggest sewer challenge? Let's get voting. So fascinating. Um, it's a lot of, uh, it, it, it's even at the moment, votes are going up. Excellent. Uh, you can see a, a really, uh, a really nice mix, almost equal across the board. And I can say that uh, pressure sewer, pressure sewer will answer a lot of these questions. Fancy that. Funding, you know, we all, we all struggle with the funding, but more and more with clean water situations and infrastructure, pressure sewer is a great alternative and a great value for citizens. So let's take a look at a case study. So what if there was a large city in the Midwest that needed to replace not one or two, but 20,000 septic tanks that have been proven to be polluting their environment? What if this you know, iconic, beautiful city had a majestic winding river that cut across the roads, the highways, the neighborhoods, the downtown, all over? And what if you were the one tasked with solving this problem? Are you gonna go cut gravity around this river, through these highways, into these developments? Or maybe because you wanna do things differently and not the way they've always been done, you could look at pressure sewer. Well, that's exactly what Citizens Energy Group in Indianapolis, Indiana did with their septic tank elimination program. In 2016, they sought out a new approach to providing sewer to its residences. Over 20,000 septic systems are targeted to be replaced by pressure sewer and gravity. So pressure sewer will play nice with gravity. They gave some incentives to the homeowners to hook in early um, financially. And they hired a program contractor to oversee the whole, uh, the whole program. And this contractor partnered uh, with E1, among other suppliers, 
to make sure that they had experts on board to provide this service to the city of Indianapolis. At E1, we provided um, some consulting, you know, trusted advisor, answer questions. We did some design analysis to give them direction, some costing to provide a high level uh, approach on how things may line up. And this is one of the most successful programs in the country. So why did they do that? What are the advantages of pressure sewer? Well, as we mentioned already, uh, small diameter pipe, right? So this small diameter pipe and shallow installation gives you a lot of flexibility and lowers construction costs. By using trenchless methods in many cases, you can avoid disrupting the environment and you can follow the contour of the ground. And this is important more and more. The social costs we're finding out is a major consideration among homeowners and city managers. Pressure sewer has a small environment disturbance. We like to say it's a light touch on the land. And you can see here in these pictures, putting it in on the right, installing it, and then the restoration on the left. More advantages. Uh, some uh, alternative sewering technologies have a central infrastructure um, that you need to send the waste to so that they can pump it more or change its direction and send it on to the treatment. Pressure sewer does not have that constraint. Uh, it can go directly towards the treatment plant or a lift station or a gravity system. It's very flexible. And with pressure sewer, you can find uh, believe me, if there's a leak or an abuser, because the waste is under pressure, it's going to leak out of the system and create, in some cases, some beautiful floral arrangements, um, which are quite easy to find if you're driving down the road and that's your business. Uh, but again, we're keeping infiltration out of the system because it's under pressure. In many cases, we can replace gravity systems, failing gravity systems, with pressure sewer. Um, Gravity systems, uh, as they get older, really lead to an increase in inflow and infiltration. And a lot of that comes from the laterals from the home. So just taking care of the laterals from the home as it is could save you as much as 30% uh, infiltration. So pressure sewer is very flexible. So system sizing, as I mentioned, it can be as small as a couple units discharging uh, down the road to a, to a manhole situation, or it can be as large as hundreds and hundreds of units connected together to form a network of small pipe and pressure sewer, and then send it on its own. And at E1, we have a free program that you can download from our website, e1.com, e-o-n-e.com, um, that'll help you do this. All of our representatives are trained and capable of helping you do this as well. And we have a staff at E1 that will do it for free and help you walk through it. So we wanna stand with all of you to make pressure sewer a dominant alternative to gravity. You know, there are many, many different applications for pressure sewer. Uh, one that we're seeing more and more, not only are replacing septic tanks, but if you have a density, a population, and then as that population expands out into outlying areas, okay, they create a subdivision. Um, the density of the population may already have a city sewer, town sewer, may have a sewer, um, a sewer program, and it's not cost effective to get it out to that subdivision. So we can come in with pressure sewer, take care of that subdivision, and then connect it back into the main um, main sewer in town. So that's, you know, that's one example. Uh, there are many other examples out there that'll help keep waste out of our drinking waters, lakes, and, and groundwater, and things like that. And pressure sewer is a good solution. In regards to that, um, there's some statistics. 20% of the homes in the United States are connected to septic tanks. And each year, 20% of them malfunction. That's a huge number. 
that's a huge number leaking waste into our environment. Um, improper design maintenance of, of these wells. You know, I remember my dad years ago, we had a drum in the yard and poked holes in it. So it would just leach out, you know, that, we don't want to do that anymore. We have a solution and it's pressure sewer. And we can take care of these leaking septic tanks across the country and across the world. So when we look at sustainability, you know, okay, is this just a one-time deal? Am I gonna have to do this over and over, and over again? If we look at sustainability and the impacts of large gravity systems, for example, there are three impacts, economic, social, and environmental. And the economic impacts as shown here include, you know, capital cost, operation and maintenance, life cycle, because equipment, you know, it doesn't last forever. Pipes don't last forever. And there's the social component, which we touched on, diminished quality of life when you're driving up and down the road for six months and there's a, a big truck in, you know, in the middle of your road, maybe it's in your yard to be safe. And what about the carbon footprint? When we look at environmental, all those, all that equipment running, creating greenhouse gases, noise pollution. So there are impacts to big gravity, economic, social, and environmental. So if we take a, a closer look at the environmental cost, um, the greenhouse gases, you know, like I mentioned, uh, all that equipment spewing up into the environment, um, the disturbance to the ground, the wetlands, sensitive areas, uh, the fact that they usually need to cut through and remove trees, bushes, and landscaping, although there's often great attention played in not doing that, it is part of big gravity. And this just uh, proves, this was a um, study done uh, that shows the different levels of emissions compared with open cut, so gravity, or trenchless uh, installations. And you can just see the chart on the right, you know, it's a big number. So if environmental uh, cost, and if you're concerned about the environment, you know, pressure sewer is a good alternative and will lower those impacts. So the social cost, you can see here, um, you know, you're gonna reroute traffic in some cases if you're downtown, so that's gonna impact businesses. Again, you're gonna have a diminished quality of life, traffic disruption, I mentioned, noise pollution, Dutch dirt, you know, worker safety, this guy in the pit, uh, you know, he was digging and it opened up and he ends up in the pit and he's gonna come out of that pit now with a lot of help. But, you know, there's safety concerns with big gravity, deep gravity, um, and this is a social cost. So more social costs, um, you know, that we talk about location, they're, they're unique to each project. With pressure sewer and trenchless technology, you can overcome many of them. You're gonna have less damage, quicker and easy restoration, uh, improve safety, because you're not going into those big deep lift stations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Less vibration, noise, air pollution, a lot of these things are the benefit of pressure sewer and not doing things the way we've always done them. And, gra you know, pictorially, this is what, you know, some big gravity projects look like. Big open trenches, big equipment, big infrastructure, disruption, safety concerns. And of course, compared to pressure sewer with the low social costs that I discussed, you can see uh, some, some trenching going on here, some directional drilling. It's quite a stark contrast. So those things are important, right? But cost, as mentioned in the poll question, you know, funding, costing, these are the things that can make a project. And in most cases will break a project as well. So you've got your initial cost, your capital construction costs, such as, you know, public components. You've also got your cost for going on the property. Um, those components, project costs and recurring costs, repair and replace or operation and maintenance. Now at E1, we also offer along with our design assistant, we offer a, um, a free tool that you can download 
that'll give you high level direction when you're doing a life cycle cost comparison. So if you wanna compare pressure sewer against gravity, you can download this program with minimal inputs, basically your local costs and, and things like that. Um, we can produce a directional uh, analysis that'll help you decide whether gravity is the right way to go or pressure sewer is the right way to go based on you know number of connections, how much it costs, the cost of pipe, things in your area. Um, it can put it together fairly quickly and arm, arm you with data. Over the years, we have uh, kept track of bid tabulations for many, many projects. And in, in you know, most cases, it's public uh, information. And we have found, along with others who've done independent studies, that the construction cost savings for low pressure sewer is typically 20 to 60% compared to gravity sewer. So let's take a look at another case study. So what if you had a sprawling countryside uh, surrounding two beautiful lakes? but nobody could swim in the lakes because they were polluted. What if the property values around those lakes started to plummet and the homeowners could not renovate or improve their property because of the sewer constraints? And what if there was a mandate, all right? Nobody wants the mandate. What if there was a mandate to improve the situation? What would you do? Well, that was the case in Twin Lakes uh, Sewer District in Indiana. They also embarked on a septic tank elimination program. It started in the early 1990s. Um, many complaints into the health department, the county government. Um, they had poor water quality, failing septic systems were the cause. In some cases, uh, the homeowners, as I mentioned, were told they can't do anything to their property. Environmental studies found that fecal contamination at the public beaches were caused by leaking septic tanks. So a program was undertaken to provide a collection systems for Lake Schaefer and Lake Freeman. And that developed into the Twin Lakes Regional Sewer District. And it represents one of the largest and most successful pressure sewer installations in the world. And they operate upwards of, of 4,000 pressure sewer connections, 4,000 grinder pumps to macerate and send the waste to a treatment plant where it can be efficiently effective treated and it's out of the water. And this area has bounced back. Uh, it is a thriving community and people are able to use the lakes again. And you can see they're having some recreation there. Thought I'd throw that in, but it's an amazing example of going from really a dire case to a role model situation. And one of the ways they would do that uh, over the years is because they could keep the construction costs lower than compared to gravity sewer. So when they did the comparisons, and again, it's like flat, wet, rocky, hilly, they had it all there. Um, the gravity would have been very difficult, very difficult to implement. And pressure sewer using the smaller pipe, a shallow barrier, all the things we talked about, was a better choice and they were able to do it quicker. You know, often gravity sewer will have multiple lift stations. That can be a lot of money and they have a lot of uh, maintenance that goes into those. Pressure sewer, few if any lift stations. Sometimes you need a lift station if you're going a long way or if there's a grade change, but in most cases you don't need any lift stations. It's smaller equipment, faster crews, faster production, fewer impacts. So what we've so shown here graphically are many, many projects uh, represented uh, by the bubbles, okay? So the, the brownish bubbles are gravity sewer and the blue ones are pressure sewer. And if you draw an average line through both of them, you can see that gravity sewer is going to cost you more than a pressure sewer. And that's based off of uh, public data, almost 35%. And just to show it another way, when you look at the components of what it takes to put in a sewer system, main line, appurtenances, on property, restoration, lift stations, you can see the components, how they add up for gravity sewer and how those components add up for pressure sewer. But in the end, 
pressure sewer is going to be about 60% of the cost of gravity sewer. The Water Environmental Research Federation evaluation showed conventional gravity systems to be approximately 80% more expensive than pressure sewer systems. So this is a good, good ballpark chart for those of you that might be considering what it costs uh, per connection, right? When all is said and done, um, and these are, are based off of public information, conventional gravity sewer system, depending on where you are, is 12 to $18,000 per connection. Pressure sewer system is shown here, 6,700 to 10,000 per connection. And again, it's dependent upon you know, you know, where you are in the, in the world. There are recurring costs, okay, with gravity specifically, system, equipment maintenance, cleaning, day-to-day -day operations, getting power to big equipment. There's renewal when you have inflow and infiltration and it's costing money in your treatment plant because you know treatment's not free. You have to pay for that. And if you've got inflow and infiltration taking up all the capacity in your plant, you know, you're not efficient and you're spending more than you should be. Um, and then there's upgrades. So gravity. Gravity is not free. Everybody walks around and says, oh, gravity is free, free. It's not free. And with our life cycle cost analysis tool, we can show you directionally the components that make up costs for pressure sewer and the components that make up cost for gravity sewer. And we can do that in the present and future analysis so you can see how it plays out over the years and do a long-term assessment on what might be the best way to go. You're gonna get a nice graphic output and some data to go with it when you compare the various technologies. So we have some myths and misconceptions, right? Okay, gravity sewer. Once installed, gravity systems are free. There is no regular maintenance required. And as you might expect, that is false. When we look at gravity sewer, you're going to have daily or weekly visits to the lift stations, um, e easily quarterly mechanical, electrical inspection and maintenance, wet well cleaning and pumping out, uh, odor control in some cases, landscaping, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. Those vacuum trucks, last time I checked, they're not free. Okay, so this myth that gravity sewer is free is really false. So let's look at another one, pressure sewer. Grinder pumps are a constant source of maintenance and are expensive to repair. Okay, we had one, uh, one district uh, when they were considering gravity to pressure sewer, uh, they went with pressure sewer and a new director took over and he's like, who was the brainchild to put 2000 grinder pumps in my district? And he was concerned about you know, how much that would tax uh, his group to maintain. And what they found out was there wasn't a whole lot of maintenance involved. Um, they're not a constant source of maintenance. So the myth and misconception, the myth, you know, that's false. Frequently held misunderstanding that pressure sewer are inherently maintenance intensive and they're not. Experience has not support, uh, supported that and well-designed, easy to install, maintain systems do not require a lot of uh, operation maintenance or cost. And that's done by an independent uh, organization. The operation and maintenance of E1 pumps and the mainline for that matter is typically insignificant. Progressive cavity grinder pumps require no preventative maintenance. Again, going back to that appliance mentality that we talked about in the beginning. Okay, life expectancy is 15 to 20 years. Now that's not to say that you're not going to need to service them. There are some wear parts. And we've calculated the average mean time between service calls is 10 years. So you have to figure within 10 years, you're going to need to replace probably that rubber stator. And the next popular question we get is, you know, how much does it cost to run? And if you recall in the beginning, I said these pumps, they run for a short period of time, many times during the day. And that has been factored out to be less than $25 per year. And that's a little conservative. As far as annualized pump maintenance, if a homeowner 
was to spend $30 or put $30 in the bank per year, they would be able to cover all the maintenance requirements for that pump. So what do you see now, right? Half full, half empty, I don't know. Well, you might see a precisely designed and optimized pressure sewer system, perfectly engineered to do the job it was meant to do. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Greg, for that informative presentation. We now have some time for some Q&A. Um, you can submit a question for Greg using the chat feature on your toolbar. Uh, we do have a few that have come in. So any questions that we don't get to live today, we'll be sure to answer offline. So Greg, our first question is, how do you prevent the positive displacement pump from running dry? The positive displacement pump when installed and maintained correctly will turn off at a predetermined level leaving liquid inside the basin so it doesn't run dry. Okay, thank you. Um, do the pumps typically belong to the utility or the homeowner? Well, that's a great question. Uh, we have seen different models, of course, and in many cases, the utility will own them or the homeowner will own them. In some cases it's shared, the homeowner owns them, but the utility will provide maintenance uh, to them. So it's really mixed and depends on the location. It can be either way. Okay, another question that came in. Um, can pressure sewers be used with other types of collection systems, for instance, gravity systems? Yeah, that's another great question. And uh, of course they can. Uh, pressure sewers often uh, used to sewer outlying communities and then pump into the existing gravity system. Uh, it does play very well with gravity and uh, it can work with other technologies as well. It's very flexible. Okay, and what happens when the power goes out? So this is another great question. We get this frequently when the power goes out. The low pressure station is designed to um, have reserve capacity in it. So if you think about a power outage, uh, inherently because the power is off, you're not gonna be using as much water that would end up in the station. Things like laundry, dishwashing, uh, long, long showers or baths. You're just not going to be doing that. Uh, so in a sense, you're going to be conserving as it is. And the station has plenty of capacity to handle uh, a couple days worth of uh, conservative use. Um, in which case, when the power comes back on, you know, it's been, it's been known that um, the average power loss is less than, less than a couple hours, but you do get events. So when the power comes back on, you'll likely be in a, um, you know, like a high level condition. It'll pump the waste down, send it on its way to treatment, and uh, you'll be good to go. Great. Um, here's a question. Can you chat about replacing a vacuum system with E1s? Can you keep the piping? Yeah, it's a good question. We, we get this once in a while because um, the vacuum systems over years uh, can have trouble. I'll just leave it at that. So municipalities may be looking for different alternatives, and it's a shame not to use existing infrastructure. Uh, can it be done? It, it probably can be done, but it's going to be cost prohibitive. Uh, so what we recommend is running line in parallel uh, with, the, with the vacuum lines. Um, again, this is something that we would like to consult on and ask that uh, you let us be your advisor in the situation. Uh, I can't say in all cases that we can't do it or in all cases that we can, um, but we can work with anyone to come up with a, a solution for pressure sewer there. And what is the largest capacity grinder pump that is available? Well, you know, grinder pumps by different manufacturers, uh, you know, they can be extensive, but at E1, we have uh, one grinder pump and it's a one horsepower pump and it is very effective. For larger flows, we can combine that with two pumps, three pumps, up to four pumps into a suitably sized station. Uh, but the answer to the question is we have a one horsepower grinder pump and that thing is installed uh, throughout the world and does a very effective job. Are there uh, any considerations for situations where a building sees very little use? So the two things you're concerned about, and this could also apply, well, you know, we say building, I think commercial, but it also applies to seasonal homes and residences. Uh, when you're designing or a slow build out on a subdivision, 
when you're designing pressure sewer, a couple of major concerns is the retention time of the waste in the system and the velocity of the waste going through the pipe. So you want enough velocity to make it to where it's going, but to also you know, scour the pipe. And you wanna have a lower retention time so you don't get odors and corrosion. Uh, and with seasonal homes and slow buildouts, there's not as much flow, okay? Flow is our friend. Um, so we will, with the flexibility of pressure sewer, design the system so that you get, you know, the lowest retention time possible with an adequate velocity going through uh, the system. Uh, for homes and seasonal applications, there are some things we recommend before they close up for the season, uh, you know, flushing a, a a, get, uh, a bathtub full of water so it cleans out the station a little bit but uh, ideally it's something we would work with uh, we and we do every day uh, work with those conditions and, and advise people great uh, will a spd pump burst pipes due to blockages and high pressure no although the the spd pump is extremely effective it, our pump is rated well well below any bursting pressure or uh, maximum allowable working pressures of the pipe in fact the pump will um, turn off uh, via the, uh, the control system before it even gets close. But even if it didn't, it wouldn't burst uh, the pipes. Okay, here's another question about power outages. How is the surge in flow handled after a power outage when multiple pumps kick on simultaneously? Yeah, it's a great question. So with these systems, like I said, you can hook up hundreds of pumps, you know, thousands in some cases. And if the power goes out for a day and then it kicks on, all these pumps are going to come on at the same time. And what happens is the pumps, you know, closest to the destination point that have the least amount of uh, friction had to overcome, they're going to, you know, they'll all kick on. They're going to operate first. They're going to evacuate their stations. And as they um, evacuate and turn off because they hit their low level, you know, the other pumps will have a chance to catch up and fill the system. The pumps on the back end of the system will continue to operate against that head. And when the system clears, it'll finish pumping and go back to normal operation. Okay, here's another question. How well do the pumps handle disposable wipes? Uh, nobody handles disposable wipes. They are the scourge of the earth and they should be outlawed, uh, but that's my opinion. <laughs> Look, uh, you know, the great thing about Environment One, we have uh, an NSF certification, uh, National Sanitary Foundation. And what they do, they, they, to get the certification, you have to pass a criteria. And the criteria is they add things, they take our, our station, our base in an independent lab, they add things in there and we have to be able to, or any pump has to be able to evacuate them successfully. And part of that is, uh, you know, besides things like the normal um, toilet paper and sanitary and metal toy cars and things, crushed glass, they put a lot of stuff down there. One of the other components they put down there are wipes. Um, it, it's tough. Wipes wrap around things and, and you know, they get caught. Uh, if it's a, uh, like a standard, you throw a wipe down now and then, our pump will evacuate it. If you throw the whole package down at once, there's going to be trouble. You know, we like to say putting things down the drain is, is three P's, paper, poop, and pee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's a question. I have experienced problems with the float switches. Have there been any improvements to the traditional tethered float switch? Yes, so thank you for that question. Float switches are problematic and they're one of the biggest maintenance items in, any, in most pressure sewer systems. Fortunately, with Environment One, we don't use float switches. We found them just to be a horrible maintenance nightmare out in the field. We use pressure switches similar to what you uh, you know, the technology used in your washing machine. So we use pressure switches as the water rises in the tank or the waste rises in the tank. It acts on an air column, which activates the pressure switch. So there's no contact with the waste. There's no um, floats hanging inside the tank that get caught up um, that can lead to, to pump failure. So float switches are problematic. I would suggest not using them when possible. Can you discuss the use of backflow preventers? If you install a pressure system for entire development and it does not happen as quickly as you thought, what happens? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, backflow preventers, uh, such as the one equipped on the uh, Environment One garner pump, you know, they, they serve one function, right? To prevent 
the, the flow of waste back through the pump and into the home, hence the name backflow preventer. Um, so they're gonna prevent other, you know, if, if that's all you have, typically at the end of the road, you're gonna have check valves that would prevent other systems from pumping into the homeowner system and backing up. So that's, you know, that's the main function of the backflow preventer. Most systems have redundancy, you know, out by the curb, we have one in the pump. Sometimes you can get two on the pump and then there's a check valve at the road. So there's a lot of redundancy to make sure you're not pumping into somebody else's basin. Um, and I think I answered as there's the seasonal flow, you know, we try to take that into account to minimize odors and retentions and, and increase velocity where possible. Great, and we, we have one more question about uh, vacation homes. How do you design for vacation homes around lakes? In the winter, the owners are gone and the entire, entire system flows are very low. In the summer, the flows are higher and very high on holidays. Right, so that is a, a challenging situation that we handle you know, on a daily basis uh, with many, many uh, installations around lakes and homes. I can think of many off the top of my head, I won't call them out, um, but it, it's tricky, right? You have to. You have to size the system to handle the 4th of July's, if you will, and to also handle, you know, December 19th when no one is at, is at the lake. And we have installations that, have, that we've done that with, and we've actually collected the data, and we've found that the standard system does an adequate job when correctly designed uh, for, again, retention time and velocity. So, you know, we work with, we have dedicated distribution partners uh, that work with every every community and homeowner. And when that comes up, we all get together and figure out the best way to do it. And we've been very successful at it. Great. Well, that appears to be all the questions that we have time for today. Uh, any questions that we didn't get to, we'll be sure to answer offline. When the meeting ends, you'll see a survey launch in your browser. We'd be so grateful if you'd let us know your thoughts about today's event. Um, on behalf of Water and Waste Digest and E1 Sewer Systems, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. So long, everybody. Thank you very much.